Welcome to episode 312 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger at SellingYourScreenplay.com. Today I'm interviewing Kristen Alexander, who is a real go-getter and talks about her film Ultra Rock and how she put it all together. She's another inspirational writer who just went out and made things happen for herself. She put the project together without having an agent or a manager, without living in Los Angeles, and without knowing a ton of people in the business. She just networked smartly, used what opportunities she got to the to her full advantage so stay tuned for that interview she's very transparent and really talks about um, her project and how she put it all together so stay tuned for that interview if you find this episode valuable please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook these social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast so they're very much appreciated any websites or links that I mention in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast. And then just look for episode number 312. If you want my free guide, How to Sell a Screenplay in Five Weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional logline and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So a quick few words about what I'm working on. I'm still running around finishing up the shoot for the rideshare killer. Um, last Saturday, I returned all the camera equipment. Um, we had a few things that got broken, so we have to deal with those and get those things fixed. That's definitely an issue when you rent stuff um, and stuff does get, you know, worn or broken. Um, you know, you have to d deal with all of that. We did have insurance on the shoot, so it's not a huge deal, and it doesn't sound like the um, the, the broken stuff is going to be more than a few hundred dollars. So I think we actually did pretty well on that. Obviously, this is all very high-end camera equipment, um, so renting, renting it, um, there is a potential if anything breaks, it's generally speaking very expensive because, as I said, it's very high-end ex um, experience. But again, the um, the guy that rented us the equipment, he's been very you know nice and super honest and transparent about everything. So. Um, again, overall, very good experience, um, and I definitely would recommend um, him specifically, but even ShareGrid in particular. I mentioned that last week on the podcast that we found this camera through a service called ShareGrid, and it's literally ShareGrid.com, um, and it's where people just list their camera equipment, and then you can find what you need and rent it. So that hopefully is is basically all taken care of. We have our wrap party on Saturday, so that should be fun to see everyone while I'm not super stressed out working. You know, while I'm on set, um, I'm just dealing with so many things. I never really got a chance to kind of sit down and talk to some of these, um, talk to some of the actors and 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 um, get to know them a little bit um, other than just sort of the working. Um, so it'll be nice to have just kind of a more casual time with these people. And, you know, it's part of the rap party, too. Um, you go through, you know, for for 17 days. It's like, you know, it's this really massive effort from everybody. Um, so when you're done, there's kind of some really sad feelings. You know, you've just spent so much time with these people for the last three weeks. Um, so it's a nice way to kind of wind that all down and kind of just see everybody and, and, and kind of get back to our normal lives. Um, and of course, there is some organizational stuff that I have to do. I have to buy snacks and drinks and all that stuff. Um, you know, again, that's one of the downsides to being one of the producers on the project is I kind of have to take care of a lot of those sort of logistical things. So, but once I get to the party, it'll be all all just winding down and, and, and relaxing. I found someone here locally um, to create the low res proxy files. He seems real good. So I'll probably have him do what's called an assembly cut. Basically, he'll sync all the sound and lay in all the pieces of the film but it will be like 25 hours as it will literally be all the footage of every decent take just stacked into a timeline in adobe premiere and then just as the director i can sit there and go through everything see all the pieces see all the footage and start to sort of see what I think is the best takes. I may then take a stab at a rough cut and then bring on an editor after that um, to really polish things up. Um, I'm not, again, that's a bit down the road, so I haven't really decided on that. I'm not what I would consider an editor. I know how to use Adobe Premiere, but I'm not really like a hotshot editor. So I definitely need to bring someone on that's more of sort of a hotshot editor, can really 
hone this thing and, and make it look professional. Um, but at least for that first rough cut, I may be able to go in and just sort of pick the takes I want um, and kind of get something loosely in place. But um, again, that's down the road, so we'll just have to see. First, um, as mentioned, he needs to create the low res proxy file so it doesn't just completely sew down my machine as I work with the media. Um, my computer just is not set up to handle these large 4K raw files. Um, these are just humongous high resolution video files that the camera is taking. And that's what you want. You want high, you want to start with a really high res um, file, but um, but then you, my computer, it just, it, it's not set up. It's not an editing computer. Um, so it just doesn't have the bandwidth to process these things. So when you dump them into Adobe Premiere, it just lags and it just barely even runs. And in fact, on my system, um, like if I put in three, just three takes, um, you know, and there's hundreds, we're talking about hundreds and hundreds of takes here for the film. But if I just drop in, you know, three takes or something, my system is just can barely even do anything. Um, so again, these files are just way way too big um, for my system, which is why I need these proxy files. And then once I have the proxy files, I can cut a teaser trailer. I can start to cut some of the pieces together. Um, and this is all in an effort to get the Kickstarter campaign going. Right now, what I'm planning is a two-week Kickstarter campaign. And the reason I'm thinking about only doing it for two weeks as opposed to like 28 days or 30 days, which is more common, is that on the last one, I found that virtually no one contributed during those middle two weeks. So I'm figuring why bother even run it for that long. Um, I'm just going to have a first week and hopefully people will contribute. And then I'm going to have a last week. Hey, this is your last week to contribute. So hopefully people will be, um, be generous and, and, and will be willing to contribute during one of those two weeks. But as again, I just didn't find there was a lot of value in running at those middle two weeks. Um, not a lot of people contributed and, um, and it's a lot of effort to keep this thing going. So I'm thinking, try and do a really good job for the two weeks. I'm going to coordinate with all the actors, too, to highlight an actor each day. That's kind of my plan for the campaign is basically if I do it for two weeks, and maybe it'll be 15 days, so I have like an extra Monday on the end of it. Um, you know, so maybe it'll be 15 or 16 days, but roughly two weeks. Um, and and I'm gonna what I'm gonna do sort of to try and just promote the Kickstarter campaign is basically try and create like a little promo for each one of the actors. We had a lot of great cast um, in this in this project, and um, that that those casts also have fans of their own too. So hopefully, um, if we highlight each one of these actors, hopefully that can kind of fold in their fans as well um, and bring them to the Kickstarter campaign. So that's sort of the idea. Um, again, two weeks highlight an actor every day, and then we'll do some other stuff, some little specials and promos and that sort of stuff. But that sort of be the gist of it um, and I'm hoping to get this all together here in the next couple of weeks so hopefully by the end of January we'll have the thing launched and um, and then you know by the middle of February we'd be, we'd be done and then um, we'd be off to the races hiring you know all the post-production people that um, that we need to finish the film anyway so that's the main thing I'm working on this week and and for the foreseeable future so now let's get into the main segment today I'm interviewing writer producer Kristen Alexander here is the interview Welcome, Kristen, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where did you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? So I grew up in Dayton, Ohio, and I've always been a writer. And uh, I had a column when I was 15 in the newspaper. And then later on, I became a journalist and newscaster in New York City. And from there, uh, I worked for most of the magazines, the women's magazines, Town and Country, Harper's Bazaar, and I also worked freelance for the Christian Science Monitor. And I covered everything from beauty articles to prison stories. And hmm. and then eventually, uh, I worked for the gov two governors of Puerto Rico in, in New York. And but I was always a writer. I was writing speeches for the governors and. Then later on in my life, I started writing books and ended up writing a novel, which and which is how I got into film. I see. I see. Okay. So, and just taking a step back, quick. I noticed on IMDb you have a good number of credits as an associate producer and executive producer. And I'm curious, um, how did you get involved in those product projects? And then ultimately, how did they help prepare you for your feature film? Well, once I decided that I wanted to um, be in film and, and take my writing skills, join, I wanted to join the Screenwriters Guild, which I'm now a member of. And so I decided to get involved with other people's films. And because I'm a 
part-time resident in Nantucket, the island, I, um, I went to work on a film there called Grey Lady, um, and, and I joined up with that team, and that team eventually I hired to be my team to produce the film that I, I authored called Ultra Rock. I see. Okay, so let's dig in. Let's go ahead and dig into Alter Rock. Take us way back. Was this a book that you originally wrote and then converted it into a screenplay? It started out as a screen as a book, and then I quickly realized I wanted to enter a contest at the American Film Market uh, where you pitch your product, and I decided to to throw it into a script and run out to Hollywood and pitch alter rock um, at this pitch contest um, and at the pitch contest after the pitch contest I had quite a little bit of interest in purchasing the script and I thought well they're just going to throw it away so I think I'll produce it myself now what do you mean why did you think they would just throw it away well because everyone told me in all the meetings that I had out there that probably um, you know it probably would never end up on the big screen and I was very ambitious and I didn't like the idea of doing things the slow way because I was already fairly advanced in years and I just thought well I'm just gonna produce this thing myself and of course I had no idea what I was getting into yeah. Um, so let's let's start. The, so let's start along that journey. So you've you've got the book written. You've pitched it. You've got at least a little bit of interest to feel like there's some interest in this as an idea. Then did you go and then write the screenplay at that point? I already wrote. Yeah, I'd already written the screenplay, and so I actually walked into the office of Ramo Law, and I said, you know, I'm a, an author. Can you help me find someone who will help me produce and raise money? For this film, and they thought I was they thought I was pretty funny, but they did help me. They were amazing. Huh. They were incredibly who, they were incredibly uh, helpful. Elsa and who who, Elsa, who were these people? You, you said their name. Who were these people? Ramo Law, which is a fairly established group out in L.A. It's R A M O Elsa Ramo, and so this woman Tiffany began to help me, and she sent me names of producers, and I just had a lot of nerve and I just started calling them up saying I've got this great script and I'm going to send it to you and it's going to be a you know a, a romantic thriller and you're going to and can you help me raise money and I'm going to make it for a million five so that's how it all started I just started calling on people how did you how did this law firm get on your radar was that somebody you met at AFM how did you even know to even go in and start talking to them well, every contact that I had in my life, I started pulling, pulling in, and I had just, I'd heard somehow that, um, oh, I had a friend from the East Coast who knew somebody at Ramo and just said, you know, you should just go in there and talk to them because they, because your, your script is kind of good. You should pitch them the story idea. So they started to help me. And um, that's how it all started, really. I see. And what kind of reception were you getting when you started just cold calling these producers? Well, what I said to everyone is that I'd raised half a million dollars already. And, of course, my idea was that I would raise that on my own, and then I'd put the rest of it out there to raise from producers. And so when I told people that I'd already raised a little bit of money, they had an interest. I got mm -hmm. quite a bit of interest, actually, in, in the screenplay. Yeah, so did you actually have the $500,000 raised, or you were just kind of, you know, fake it till you make it? I was fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. <laughs> Definitely fake it till you make it. So, um, okay, so we're going along this journey, and then what kind of reception are you getting from these producers? Are some of them coming on board? Are you optioning the script? What kind of no, deal I are you cutting with them? I found that the producers, of course, don't forget this was three years ago. I found mm -hmm. that the producers were incredibly eager to come on board, and I got a little nervous. And so I found myself actually turning down producers, and I thought, you know, I better go out. I better work on, on a film myself to find out what's going on behind the scenes. And that's when I went to work for um, Eric Dane's, the movie uh, Grey Lady. I see. Um, and then when I worked on that film, I decided to hire that entire, the director and the producers to produce my film. I see, I see. And at this point, had you raised some money? Yeah, by that 
that time I'd already raised a, a million dollars. Okay. And so walk just us, through, walk us through that. Okay, through friends and family, I see. Yeah, friends and family. Uh, actually, uh, I have a couple of people that were not close friends, but they just thought they'd take a gamble. They wanted to be in, you know, in a low budget, involved in a low budget project like this. Mm -hmm. Take take and us I through have, that pitch. Not, yeah. <laughs> take us through that pitch a little bit. These friends and family. Um, what does your pitch to them look like? Um, did you do a kind of a proper, you know, slideshow presentation, or are you talking about ROI? Like, what is the pitch to them to bring these people on board? Well, I said, you know, I've hired this uh, famous director, uh, Andre Barkoviak, who's done big hundred million dollar films like Romeo must die and I've hired his two producers from Boston and if you want to be involved in a movie this is going to be fun you know um, I'll put your daughter in it she can be a PA and you know we're going to really have fun just give me you know thirty thousand dollars and you know I'll get you involved that's how it started and okay. you know, it was it, it worked pretty well <laughs> So, and how many wow. how many people are you pitching to actually get this? I mean, at thirty thousand dollars to get to you know a million dollars, that's quite a few people. Well, I had some. Um, well, also, don't forget, I had the Massachusetts tax credit, and um, w and then I had my producer had somebody who was willing to lend us lend us some money. Um, so it didn't take me too long to get up to the million, but then after that. It got a little bit tougher. Um, I ended up, um, you know, money was a, as it always is, money's the biggest uh, hurdle of all. <laughs> was, mm -hmm, sure. It was really tough. It got tough. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so at what point did you um, run into KJ Appa and how did you bring him into the project? So, um, Andre Barkoviak had a lot of connections in the film world, obviously, and uh, he, Nancy Nair, who's a casting agent, he went out to her and she started interviewing young men. And actually, KJ was fairly, had not, not even appeared in Riverdale yet. He was just a young actor from New Zealand who had never been in a film. And so we hired him. It was his first film. India Isley, who's Olivia um, Hussey's daughter, she was fairly new, too. And then we hired people through Boston Casting because we were going to sh – we shot the movie in Duxbury. Uh, and it was – we faked that for Nantucket. The, the story is centered in Nantucket, Massachusetts. But Duxbury is a good option. So um, – we went to Boston Casting, and they they found us James Remar, who you know is in Dexter. He plays Dexter's dad, and he's mm -hmm. in a lot. Of, he's in a lot of films. And uh, then I got some Nantucket actors like John Shea, who's famous in Nantucket, to kind of fill in. But uh, KJ was a, a big find. He mm -hmm. was not famous at all, and and it's turned out that that's going to be the key element to selling the film. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. So maybe just to um, take a step back, you can give us a quick picture log on. What is Alter Rock about? What is the, um, the log on for it? So Alter Rock is a romantic thriller about a young girl, Tilly, from New Jersey, whose parents have died in a tragic airplane crash on the island. And she's distraught, obviously, because she's an only child. She's gone to live in Nantucket with her aunt. And she falls in love with a young young taxi driver um, who uh, is living in Nantucket, played by KJ. And his older brother is a terrorist. And Nantucket does um, have a lot of um, Eastern European immigrants there who, um, it's controversial there, but they're usually hard-working young men and anyway KJ in, in the in the show is very accepted into Nantucket into American ways but the older brother who comes to Nantucket to break up the relationship is really um, a terrorist he's enough older so that he will never be accepted here and I base that relationship on what I knew about the Boston bombers hmm. So the Boston Bombers intrigued me because my daughter 
uh, knew people who knew the younger Boston bomber, who knew him at U- UMass. And hmm. she told me that, you know, he was very well accepted and liked. He had a popular girlfriend. And that the odd thing, the sad thing was his o- older brother sucked him into this horrible act of vengeance and really cruel things happen, as you know, during that event. And yeah. so I was intrigued by the idea of what if the younger brother had fallen in love with an American girl, what would he really, what would he do? Hmm. Would he have gone through with it? Yeah. So let's talk about the writing process a little bit. Um, on IMDb, you have a shared writing credit with um, with Wayne Carter. Maybe you can talk about that relationship. It sounds like you wrote the first draft of the script, and then at what point did this other writer come in, and how did that relationship, how was the collaboration, how did that actually work? Well, um, actually, I met Wayne um, at the AFM, and I knew that since I'd never written a screenplay, and I, I didn't, want to fool around too long I really wanted to jump on this so Mm -hmm. I said to Wayne you know I'm I'm really a novelist and I'm just a regular old feature writer could you take a look at what I've got here and we'll work together because I'm going to do this one way or the other and he was experienced and he said yes and we've been working together ever since we are pitching a series right now we work very well together and he's just terrific so I think in some cases it might not work so well, but for the two of us, we collaborate really well. I see. And what does the collaboration actually look like? So you had a first draft, and then he did he go through it and take his pass? Did he give you notes on it, and then you yeah. guys would work together in the same room doing the edits? Well, since he's in, we're in different places, um, we would work sometimes on Skype um, and then sometimes on FaceTime, and we just work away at the actual plot, how to make it uh, more dramatic, how to make it more romantic. And we just would talk for, say, two hours, two or three times a week. And then he flew to Nantucket, actually. When the, in the final edit, we actually worked with the director every day for two weeks to make changes to the final, the final draft. I see, I see. Okay, so let's talk about um, just writing that first draft. Um, what, is, what did that actually look like? Where do you typically write, and when do you typically write? Are you a morning person, a night person? Um, and then do you have a home office? Do you write at Starbucks? What does that look like? <laughs> I usually write right in my kitchen. I start around 11, and I just sit right in a chair. I don't work at a desk, even though I have one. I just sit in a chair and just start typing away. Um sure. And then I like to get together with Wayne in the afternoons, and um, he takes, we, we kind of work it out together. Um, I see. We've done quite a few. We have, we, but we have a couple of scripts up on the blacklist right now. Um, we took my novel and turned that, that into um, a screenplay. Unfortunately, I'm told that it's a $20 million project. <laughs> so uh, yeah. that's going to be tough to sell. Sure. How much time do you spend when, and, and we can use um, use um, Alter Rock as an example, how much time do you spend preparing like an outlining and then versus how much time do you spend actually in final draft writing dialogue and action? I would say time-wise, we probably jump, we jump right in. We don't even do outlines. We, we actually hmm. do sentence composition together as we, we go page by page. There's not much outlining. Um, we kind of we we when we speak we speak the characters' roles together. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah. But I mean, you must have had some idea like what the ending of this movie was going to be before you started. There must have been something. I mean, you didn't just open a blank page and say, "Okay, let's start writing a script." There must have been some preparation, even if that's just thinking about you know what the well, story is all about. Yeah, I knew we wanted to open up the uh the film with the plane crash um tilly's parents die in a plane crash at the opening and actually the 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 opening is a little bit different than that although the plane crash is post on it but then and i knew and then i knew actually we principal was three years ago so this has taken a long time and i knew by the end um 
six months ago, I knew that I really wanted a happy ending. I feel like there's, so, I don't really enjoy films that don't have some kind of hopeful ending. <laughs> so mm -hmm. I knew that we wanted the two characters to end on a happy note and a hopeful note. So we do have that ending. Um, and we struggled a lot with the ending with the director and with the producers too. We all sat in a room. I see, I see. How did you go into this, um, actually, taking a step back, how does that differ than writing novels? Um, do you, when you write a novel, do you not spend a lot of time outlining, you just open and start writing? Um, how much, you know, how does it compare to writing a script versus writing a novel in terms of that preparation? I think a novel is harder in a way, and I do do a lot of outlining when I write a novel. Um, hmm. A novel is, um, of course, now they're all written to, to be read, um, uh, but uh, aloud. But I think writing dialogue is so much more fun than writing a novel. I much prefer screenwriting hmm. to being a novelist. Uh, a novel has to have a, um, you know, like building a house. And, of course, making a movie is like building a house, too. But mm -hmm. I think um, writing a screenplay is more fun because there's so much dialogue, which is what... I love that part. Huh. So um, I like to just put the words out there and then you kind of squeeze it into a shape. Um, but yeah, I always know the story from the beginning to end in my mind. Yeah. Um, how do you... How do you how do you approach screenplay structure? Um, there's this sort of very template, you know, the Blake Snyder, the Sid Fields, and then I've talked to a number of screenwriters on this podcast that are much more sort of free-forming. Um, how did you go into screenplay structure? Were you very aware of that three-act structure, the beginning, middle, and end, the turning points, and that sort of stuff? Well, Wayne kind of taught me that part, that you have to have the, you know, the arc and the, you know, you have to have the structure, and I'm more free-form than that, so he always takes this, the story that I have in my mind and he puts it into the, he, he, he jams it into the structure of the screenplay format. Um, I'm less aware of that than he is. He's been working on hundreds of screenplays for his entire career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, maybe just more of a general question. Um, what advice do you have for writers who are thinking about taking this on? Um, they've got a script that they're passionate about and they're thinking, you know, I want to go and I want to produce my own, my own film. Maybe just give us some sort of some macro lessons that you learned um, going through this process. Yeah, I think it, it is hard not living in, in Los Angeles, but it is possible, especially working around centers where there are film people around, like uh, joining some of these film groups, like, uh, well, the 32, Stage 32, 32 or the, sure. there's different groups you can, but I think the most important thing um, really is finding a producer to work with and then finding a, a group of people to be with and to work with because it's mm -hmm. really a group sport. And um, I didn't appreciate that back in the beginning and then going to things like reading the trades going to things like the AFM and just going out there and just being in the group and finding out what's going some of the lectures finding out what's mm -hmm. going on is a big big plus um, because it's really about who you attach yourself to um, and eventually it's about what actress you or actor you attach to your product because mm -hmm. that's going to draw in the producer and then you're going to enhance the finances to support the project, right? Yeah. What was your pitch to this director? Um, you're working on this film um, that he's doing, and then you approach him and say, hey, I'm a writer and I'm trying to be a producer. What did that look like? Did you tell him? At that point, had you already raised some money so you could actually pay him a little bit of money to bring him on as the director? What did that, because it seems to me that was sort of the, the first sort of name person you had involved with this. You're exactly right. And I said... I said, Andre, I've got this script which has attracted a lot of interest, and it's based um, from the Boston Bomber. It's a takeoff of the Boston Bomber relationship between the two boys. And I said, um, and I've got almost a million dollars raised. What would you would you be interested? And if so, what would it take financially to get you interested? And could you work 
with the same team that worked on Grey Lady. And he said, um, yes, and that's how it all started. started. Uh, I see. So when you, were raising the, but when you were raising the million dollars, though, you didn't have his name attached or, no, or any no. name talent or anything. So no. it was just you pitching to these people. Exactly. That's exactly right. Which was, Now, looking back, I can't believe I was able to raise anything because I didn't really have anything to show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <clears throat> so I just like to end the interviews um, just by asking the guests what they've seen recently. Is there, is there any, you know, TV, movies, anything, Netflix, Hulu, whatever, um, that you've seen recently that maybe is a little under the radar that you thought was really good? Um, I'm watching Goliath right now, which I think is <laughs> a series. I'm watching yeah. a lot of series. And um, I've, I've yet to see Meryl Streep in Lemonade. I'd like to see that. Um hmm. I think it's very hard right now. The independent film business is really tough uh, yeah. because uh, so many of the streaming services are Netflix, Amazon. They're all they all have production companies. So I really think pitching production companies within the streaming services, if you have a, a, a script that you think is really good, I think that's a good idea. And you just yeah. um, get on, get on IMDb. DB and get the guts up to call them up. Call them cold. You just don't know. Yeah, yeah, for sure. How can people see Alter Rock? Do you know what the release schedule is going to be like? Well, I know we're taking it to the AFM, which is the first week of November, and mm -hmm. my sales agents taking it there and hoping, hopeful to sell it there. And um, if not there, it's going to be sold within the next few few months. And KJ has a film coming out called I Still Believe which is a Christian film about a singer whose wife dies, and it's a very powerful, big-time movie. So I would love for Ultra Rock to come out after that big movie. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. What's the um, best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Twitter, Facebook, a blog, anything you're comfortable sharing, I will round up for the show notes. Well, Instagram, I'm my name, Kristen Alexons, on Instagram. And Ultra Rock does have a Twitter it's one word. Um, that's the best way, really. Okay, perfect, perfect. I'll round that stuff up for the show notes and, and put those in. Um, Kristen, I really appreciate you coming on the show and, and talking to me. This is a very inspiring story. Um, I wish you a lot of luck with this film and, and, of course, your series and all your other projects as well. I look forward to hearing about those. Thank you very much. Nice talking to you. I'm sorry about the video. Hey, no problem at all. <laughs> Thank you. We'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye-bye. I just want to talk quickly about SYS Select. It's a service for screenwriters to help them sell their screenplays and get writing assignments. The first part of the service is the SYS Select screenplay database. Screenwriters upload their screenplays along with a logline, synopsis, and other pertinent information like budget and genre, and then producers search for and hopefully find screenplays they want to produce. Dozens of producers are in the system looking for screenplays right now. There have been a number of success stories come out of the service. You can find out about all the SYS Select successes by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash success. Also on SYS podcast, podcast episode 222, I talk with Steve Deering, who was the first official success story to come out of the SYS Select database. When you join SYS Select, you get access to the Screenplay Database along with all the other services that we're providing to SYS Select members. These services include the newsletter. This monthly newsletter goes out to a list of over 400 producers who are actively seeking writers and screenplays. Each SYS Select member can pitch one screenplay in this monthly newsletter. We also provide screenwriting leads. We have partnered with one of the premier paid screenwriting leads services so I can syndicate their leads to SYS Select members. There are lots of great paid leads coming in each week from our partner. Recently, we've been getting five to ten high quality paid leads per week. These leads run the gamut. There's producers looking for a specific type of spec script to producers looking to hire a screenwriter to write up one of their ideas or properties. They're looking for shorts, features, TV, and web series pilots, all types of projects. If you sign up for SYS Select, you'll get these leads emailed directly to you several times per week. Also, you get access to the SYS Select forum where we will help you with your logline and query letter and answer any screenwriting related questions that you might have. We also have a number of screenwriting classes that are recorded and available in the SYS Select forum. These classes, these are all the classes that I've done over the years, so you'll have access to those 
whenever you want. Once you join, the classes cover every part of writing your screenplay from concept to outlining to the first act, second act, third act, as well as other topics like writing short films and pitching your projects in person. Once again, if this sounds like something you'd like to learn more about, please go to sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. Again, that is sellingyourscreenplayselect.com. On the next episode of the podcast, I'm going to be interviewing York Alec Shackleton, who was on the SYS podcast a while back, episode number 236. I will link to that in the show notes. Check it out if you haven't already. In that episode, we kind of go into his origin story. Um, he's one of these guys that just started doing documentaries, started doing um, skateboarding videos, and eventually was able to um, segue that into feature films. So again, really nice guy, super um, transparent about his struggles and how he's gotten his films made. Um, so he's back next week with another film called Disturbing the Peace, starring Guy Pierce. We'll be talking about that film and how that all came together for him. So keep an eye out for that episode next week. That's the show. Thank you for listening.